All right. I'm, I'm going to be annoying and suggest that you all move here so we can all be together, but only if we're all up for it. Uh, I, I am trying to guilt you into it, but yeah. not too much, not too much, uh, not too much. Okay. Hi, I'm Oded. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about uh, generative art today. I'll explain a bit what it is, and I'll show you how to get started with a library called V5 or processing. All right, so what's in it for you? Why should you listen to this? And why am I talking to you about this? So I always wanted to create visual art, uh, but I cannot paint or draw for the life of me. When I was a kid, my mother used to do my art class homework, so I don't fail, fail. that worked, but I still want to create art. Uh, and it wasn't until I got to, into generative art that I understood that there are a lot of different paradigms to creating art. You don't have to use a paintbrush and canvas, or I should say, there's different types of paintbrushes and canvases. And I want to show you that today. And that also applies to all kinds of art forms. So visual art, video, music, uh, even storytelling, especially with the AI models that we see today. There's a lot of different ways to create art. So if you also cannot paint, you can still be an artist and you might already have the tools needed for it. I also want to show you that uh, this is a great way to kind of maintain or even expand your technical skills. Uh, everything plays into this, uh, understanding an algorithm, implementing one or devising one, um, thinking about performance, how to improve it, real time, not real time, refactoring, when do you stop and make the code easier to work with to get what you want. Uh, everything kind of fits into this as well. By the way, I have a lot of uh, uh, things that can lead you into interesting rabbit holes. So look for the rabbit icon and the text by it is what you should look for uh, to go down that rabbit hole. Specifically, this, this one is an AI model I use to generate these um, pictures. Super interesting to take a look. And I will uh, share a list of all the links that I'm talking about in the presentation at the end. Finally, I want to show you that making weird stuff is, is just fun, uh, very liberating. So when I approach both generative art and my day-to-day -day work as well, I kind of identify two approaches that I use. The first one is I have a problem that I need to solve or an idea uh, in my mind that I want to execute. And I try to break, break that down into smaller problems and kind of tackle it. There's also the aspect of just like pure exploration and experimentation and kind of seeing what if I connect this to this, what if I do this, and without even like a concrete idea in mind, just exploring new stuff. And I feel that that can lead to, first of all, fun things and weird things, but also innovative um, new features in your day-to-day -day work as well. Okay, so a bit about me. I've been writing code for a long time, over 15 years all kinds of languages. Right now I'm using TypeScript the most, I think, uh, and I really enjoy it. I've worked in Assyrian for the last 10 years. I uh, did a lot of different roles, uh, worked on a lot of different products, started from Israel in Tel Aviv, actually, and moved to Nashville about three years ago with my wife and two daughters. Nashville is great. In my spare time, I'm a musician, play uh, bass and guitar in a lot of different rock bands. But lately, uh, I've been uh, messing around with electronic music, mostly modular synthesizers and drum machines. And it, in fact, there's a lot of parallels to uh, programming as well with this kind of uh, music, but that's, that's a different talk. Uh, so I got into generative art in the last year or so. And I'm mostly interested in the intersection of code, art, and music. So I'll show you a few things. <clears throat> Let me bring up the volume. Can we hear anything? I'll try to reshare just a sec.
can we hear from the Zoom? Right. Cool. So this is um, an experiment to use the solar system as a music sequencer. It is not scientifically accurate, but just for fun. Uh, what's happening here is that every time the planet crosses the 12 o'clock mark, it emits a sound, always the same sound, except for Mercury, the closest planet, which emits the bad sound. Uh, what I wanted to explore here is just um, what would happen if I take a system uh, that is a bit unpredictable, but still has some uh, repetition with some frequency. Is that <clears throat> Okay, thanks. This is uh, another experiment of trying to uh, visualize and audibleize, I think that's right, uh, different maze generation algorithms. What's happening here is that I implemented a few maze generation algorithms in my mind, and wherever the green square is, meaning where the algorithm is looking at right at that moment, I emit a sound and that kind of determines the tone. So uh, other than just being silly and a bit funny, which I really liked, I felt like this kind of helps me feel the algorithm in a way that we are not really used to. Um, and maybe it gives you a better grasp of what's going on here. Okay. I'll show the link to that afterwards. Okay. <clears throat> so let's start. Let's talk about uh, some terms first. By the way, this image is uh, Pete Mondrian's painting, which I ran through an algorithm called the genera generalized smoke algorithm. Super interesting, check it out. So what is generative art? To answer that, I'm gonna take a step back and answer what is art. We talked about that a bit. <clears throat> so just kidding, I'm not gonna touch that one. That's way too big. <laughs> it's very controversial and it's less relevant for now. So I'm gonna cheat and say, Whatever you want to call art, that's, that's fine with me. Good art, bad art, it's all art, that's fine. So what is generative art? Uh, generative art is art created using some autonomous process um, involved in the making. What's an autonomous process? It's some process that is not under direct control of the artist, of the person that is creating the artwork. So there's a lot of different approaches for, uh, using, uh, for creating autonomous processes. I'm going to talk about three randomness, uh, using a set of rules, <clears throat> and natural systems. By the way, this uh, part of the presentation is based on a great blog post by Amy Goodchild, uh, titled, unsurprisingly, What is Generative Art? Uh, and this artwork is by her as well. So randomness. Uh, when I say randomness, what, what do I, how do I use it in my sketches, in my artworks? Um, everywhere, really. Everything can be randomized, right? A color, a size, a position, count of different particles, distance, even the, the shape, uh, different shapes, everything can be randomized. Um, it doesn't always have to be fully randomized. So for example, if I want a random integer, I'm not gonna pull one from the complete integer series. Maybe I'll limit the range to an integer between 10 and 20. So I can still have some uh, control, some still, I can still direct it. Uh, but it's still random and still create different variations from the same code. Uh, as a side note, when I talk about randomness, I'm probably talking about pseudo randomness. True randomness is super hard to achieve with computers. Um, there are a few different methods to, to doing that. Quantum computing using lava lamps and visual analysis. Super interesting, take a look. Um, another way to kind of direct uh, the randomness is not to use an even distribution. What does that mean? Uh, going back to the example of an integer between 10 and 20, if I use a, an even distribution, that means that each value has the same probability to be chosen. It doesn't have to be like that, right? I can bias my randomness towards some uh, area. So this is an example of that. What's happening here is that in each square, we place random points where the Y value of the point is completely random with an even distribution but the X value is not. Uh, so if we take a look at the bottom right corner, that's the Gaussian probability distribution. And what's happening here is that um, values closer to the center have more probability to be chosen. So this is another way to have some 
agency and still direct randomness, but also create some variance. If you're interested in a list of different probability distributions, also super useful and interesting, uh, check out this one. Okay, moving on. Uh, another way to create autonomous processes is to use uh, a set of rules, a rule set, and have some components in your code follow a set of instructions. And that can create um, emergent complexity from something relatively simple. So this is an example. Uh, you might be familiar with this already. This is Conway's Game of Life. What's happening here is that Conway's Game of Life is a zero player game. You set the rule set and the starting point, and each step is each next step is computed based on this current step. Uh, for each square, you compute if it's going to be alive, meaning full, or dead, meaning empty, based on the number of living neighbors it has at the current step. Specifically, Conway's Game of Life is a, uh, an instance of that rule set with I think two and three living neighbors will keep a uh, square alive and exactly three living neighbors will bring a dead square to life but that doesn't have to be the only rule set so this is this is a playground I created to try and explore different uh, rule sets for con for um, the generalized um, concept is cellular automata. That's what it's called. I can just get a random rule set. I can get uh, random colors for each square based on how many living neighbors it has. And I can uh, run with it and see what happens. This is kind of cool. I haven't seen this yet. So this, is, this, is, this wasn't pre-planned. I don't know that rule set, but it's still pretty amazing to see something like this kind of emerge from a very simple rule set. Let's uh, take another example. Also kind of cool, almost looks organic, which I really like. Yeah. I have a link to this uh, in, the in the notes, so you can play around with this as well. Okay. Another example I want to show of an artwork based on a rule set is by an American artist called Saul Lewitt. This is an example of art not using code. This is physical art. And what's happening here, this is from a series of artworks called wall drawings, where for each wall drawing, it gives a set of rules or a set of instructions. And it's kind of up to the person that wants to display it, the gallery or anywhere else to implement that set of rules. So this is wall drawing 51. The rule set for this one on the instructions are simply all architectural points connected by straight lines. So you can see the sprinkler connected to the door, to the sign, to uh, the switch, to everything else. This is, to me, this was really mind blowing. This, changes completely based on where it's displayed. But the rule set is one sentence, right? You can see a short video of people implementing it. Very, very cool. Another wall drawing, this is wall drawing 614. The set of instructions for this one uh, is rectangles formed by three inch wide in India ink bands meeting at right angles. So in this one, there's a bit more agency to the person that is executing the rule set, but it's still very different uh, based on where you display it and how you choose to implement it, right? All right. And finally, I'm going to talk about natural systems as a way to implement autonomous processes. And the idea with this is to try and imitate uh, nature or natural behavior and think about biology and trying to imitate organisms or cells or other li living things like plants, trees, leaves, uh, or even physics, trying to simulate a model, a Newtonian system or relativistic system, chemistry, trying to uh, imitate particles and the forces applying between them. So what's happening in this sketch is that each particle is either, either attracts the other particles or rejects them. So you can kind of see them clumping together. And uh, when I switch the forces, 
they're pushed to the edges. So here's another example of this. This uh, artwork is based on the way crystals grow. Uh, I think the logic here is that each pixel, pixel's color is determined by its neighbors, some average or something like that. You can read about crystal growth if you're interested. Here's another example. Uh, this is based on black hole, uh, a black hole system. Obviously not scientifically accurate, but still really, really cool. And this is the last example. This is based on an algorithm called space colonization, which tries to imitate the way a root, a roots, roots of a tree kind of grow in the, in the earth to try and find nutrients or veins on a leaf. Uh, and it's just, well, you can see the results. Okay, any questions up till now? All right. So what is processing or P5? Processing is a library created in, I think, 2001 for uh, visual purposes, uh, simulations, games, uh, visualizations, other things as well. You can do with it whatever you want, really. There are a few different ports. There's a JavaScript port, which I'm going to show you today. There's a Python port, um, a Java port, which has a bit better performance if you're looking for more real time. I think there's even like a closure port, so you can kind of pick and choose what you like. Okay, let's let's make something. So for this, I'm going to use the P5 web editor. This is kind of like a code pen or replet uh, where you can just write the code and execute it and see it side by side. If you, but you can absolutely just use an IDE for that and load the library onto an HTML file. That will work, right? I even suggest starting out with an IDE so you can get autocomplete uh, documentation just built in, super useful to get started with. All right, so what do we see here? This is a file called sketch.js. And what we see are two functions, the setup function, which is going to be called once at the start of the sketch. And it's used to create the canvas and set up everything else we want. And the second function is the draw function that is going to be called for each frame that we render. This is where we will actually draw stuff into, onto the canvas. So the first call here is just creates the canvas. I'm going to make it a bit bigger. The first argument is the width, and the second is the height. And this call, the background call, just erases the canvas with some solid color. If you pass one argument, it's going to be grayscale. But you can also pass in three arguments, which will make it RGB. OK, so let's start. Let's start by rendering, drawing one circle. So the circle function is built into P5. And I'm going to render it. Uh, the first two arguments are x and y for where to draw it. And the third is just the size in pixels. So you can see the circle here in the top left corner. You can think about the canvas as just a grid starting from top left. Let's move it to the center of uh, our canvas. I'm going to use a global parameter built into P5 called width and another one called height. Width and height of our canvas. We see it in the middle. All right, let's make it more interesting. Let's uh, mess around with the color. So the way you define colors in P5, you first uh, define it, and then everything you draw afterwards will use that color. So you can define the fill, the inside of the shape, we can draw, uh, define the stroke, which is the outside, the border. So let's get a random fill. I'm going to use the random function to get a random number between 0 and 255. One for red, one for green, one for blue. Let's take a look. All right, and we can see our, square, our uh, circle changing colors. Cool. Uh, what I want to show you now is that one of the major advantages that using code and a computer for creating art is that it's super easy to make it interactive, right? So instead of drawing the circle at the center of the canvas, I'm going to change it so it follows my cursor. I'm going to use another uh, couple of global variables, mouse x, 
and mouse Y, these are set every frame. All right, and we can see it following cursor. Next thing I want to show is that uh, right now we're erasing the uh, canvas every frame, but we don't have to do that. We can draw the next frame on top of the previous one. And that's going to create a cool effect. Let's see. Okay, this is starting to get interesting, right? Let's now try to mess around with the size of the circle. So right now we have it hard coded to 30 pixels. Let's change it to something else. And what I want to do is I don't want it to be completely random. I want something that kind of oscillates in a range of numbers. So I need a function that oscillates. Does anyone know of a function like that? Yes. So the sine function receives one argument and it gives me a number between minus one and one. I'm going to use that also built into P5. And I need an argument that changes every frame. Luckily, P5 has something like that, which is called frame counts. Just keep track of num the frame number. Uh, so this gives me a number between minus one and one. Let's get a bigger range. So I'm going to multiply it by 20. So this is now a number between minus 20 and 20. I'm adding it to 30, so the range will be 10 to 50. All right. This is starting to uh, generate a more interesting effect here. It's oscillating a bit too quickly for my taste. So I'm going to divide this by 10 just to make it a bit slower, be more gradual. This is more what I was aiming at. All right. Any questions up till now? If I draw a rectangle, what's the question? The fill is applied to anything I draw afterwards. So if I have a square here, let's do it. Let's see what happens. Let's draw it uh, with some shift. And let's have that oscillate too. So hard to see, but the colors do match, right? Whenever I draw a circle and a square, it's the same color. So if you call fill again with that after the circle or before square, that would change the color. Exactly. Yes. Okay. This is kind of like what I was mentioning when I uh, talked about exploration. When you have some idea, you can just try it out and see what happens. A lot of the time it will lead to a happy mistake that can itself lead you down a rabbit hole of interesting artworks. Okay, so now this is cool, but now I want uh, the circle maybe to not follow the cursor, but just bounce off the edges like a ping pong. So what I'm going for this, what I need to do is I need to keep track of the X and Y values. I'm going to use a uh, velocity for this and just update the X and Y values each frame based on the velocity. I'm going to use different velocities for uh, the X axis and the Y axis. So the VX with VY. Uh, for X, let's start with a random number between zero and the width of the canvas. Same for Y, just with the height. Let's set VX to a random between minus five and five. Didn't mention this, but as you can see, if I don't give two arguments, the first argument, like the lower range, lower bound is zero, but I can give two arguments and set the lower and upper bounds for random. And same for Y velocity. All right, now I need to update the X value based on the X velocity, same for Y. And I need to use them when I render the circle. 
okay, this is good, but it's not bouncing off the edges yet. Uh, what would I need to do to make it bounce? Yes, exactly. So let's check if it's out of bounds. So less than zero going out of the left side or more than the width. And if so, I'm just going to flip the velocity. And same for y. A very common mistake is to copy and paste and not change width to height. So be sure to remember that. Or not, might lead to an interesting mistake. Let's see. Cool. And we have our uh, psychedelic worm here bouncing off the screen. But to me, it looks a bit lonely. So let's add some more uh, uh, worms and, and, and make a party. And what I want to show you with this is that like, this is just JavaScript, right? I can create a class and encapsulate all the logic inside. I'm going to create a class called particle. I was uh, doing a dry run yesterday and it wasn't working. It took me like 20 minutes to figure out that I misspelled constructor. <laughs> <laughs> so please check me while I write code and let me know if I do something like that again. Okay. So this is all the initializations. I just need to turn them into members. And what I like to do with particle type classes is to have two functions, one for updating the state and one for using the state to render to the screen, kind of like uh, React or game engines, very similar. So let's have an update function with this logic inside. Turn it into a member. By the way, this is clipboard history. There's a few apps to do this. If you don't have this, install it now. It will change your life. Sorry? I actually don't have it in the notes, but I'll add it. OK, and let's have a draw function, which uh, just uses this logic. And I'm going to turn these into members as well. OK, let's create a particles array. Let's put in one, just one to start with, make sure it, it's working. And now I need to iterate over the array. Sorry. Gonna call the update function for each one and then the draw function. That's it. Let's see. All right. Works. Uh, let's have uh, several. So I'm going to create a constant at the beginning of the file. I like to put all the constants at the start. That makes it easier to tweak stuff and experiments. So let's have a num particles. Set it to 10. And I'm just going to have a for loop and create 10 particles. I think that's it. Let's see. Cool. We have a warm party. All right, this is what I wanted to show with the first sketch. Uh, and what I like to do after I had an idea, I implemented it, is play the what if game, right? What if we change the color to uh, be based on the position? What if the particles can interact? And if they collide, maybe they merge, or maybe they give birth to a new particle. Or what if? These are not circles, right? What, what if these are squares? Square. Same sketch, different vibe, right? This gives 
like a different type of feeling. Um, any other suggestions of experiments we can try out? Rotate the background. Rotate the background. Background might be a bit hard, but I can rotate the shape. Let's give it a square and rotate the shape. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use something called a transform. And you can think of it as a stack that has transforms. So I'm going to push a transform and then pop it, pop, pop it from the stack. So let's push. I can even do it here. No, you know what? I'll do it here. And I'll pop it afterwards. The trick is that we need to uh, also use the translate transform. So I'm going to use two transforms. Translate, which just resets where 0, 0 is at. And then I'm going to use rotate. That's So the rotation axis would be 0, 0. So let's do translate to this x and this y. And then I can just render it at 0, 0. Let's see that it works. This works. By the way, this like if this kind of looks weird, this is because that the anchor for squares is uh, the top left corner as default. I can change that though with something called rec mode center. Looks better. Okay, so we translate it. Now we need to rotate. We need to rotate. I guess. Let's use frame count and see what happens. Cool. I was not expecting this. Very cool. All right. Uh, let's move on. Back to the circles. So I'm going to use this as the basis for um, the next sketch. I'm uh, going to keep the particle class. Everything is good here. I'm, I'm going to set it to a constant color. Let's make it green. Uh, and constant size as well. Sorry? Which one? So this is, this is part of the particle class. And I'm uh, iterating all, over all the particles and calling, calling draw for each one, right? Yeah. The so P5 is calling the draw method for every frame. So every frame, all particles are updated and all particles are rendered. Okay, so we change the green, set it to a constant size. Let's uh, make the black uh, the background black. And I'm going to I do want to erase it every uh, frame. Cool. This is what I want to do. But uh, let's uh, have you know what, let's keep it 10 for, for now. What I want to explore with this is interactions between particles. So let's start with just drawing a line between every pair. So after I updated everyone and draw, I'm just gonna iterate <clears throat> over the particles. And uh, it's per the permutation doesn't matter. So I'm going to do uh, from the first one to the one before last. And I'm going here to, going to start from, so J from I plus one until the last particle. And I'm going to use a function called line built into P5. It accepts four arguments, X and Y for the first points, X and Y for the second points. Let's maybe uh, put them in a, a variable. Now I can do P1X, P1Y, P2X, P2Y. Let's run. Okay, so we're not seeing it yet. Something does look kind of off here. This is because, um, as I mentioned, you can set the fill, which is the inside of the shape. You can set the stroke, which is the outside. The line doesn't have any inside, right? It's only stroke. So let's set, and the stroke is black by default. 
So let's set that to green as well with the stroke method. Cool. Let's have more particles. Doesn't cost us anything. All right. This is cool, but it's uh, a bit of a mess. So instead of always drawing the line, by the way, um, the jitter is because of Zoom. It's not because of uh, P5. So on, on my computer, it works. <laughs> Super smooth. And I will also share a link to all the sketches so we can play around with the code as well. You can mess around the frame, yes. Uh, I can't mess around with the zoom frame right though. So no fix for now. Uh, okay, so instead of always drawing a line, let's draw a line only if particles are close. So let's have another constant called max distance. Set it to say 100, maybe 120 pixels. And now what we need to do is only draw it if it's less than that distance. How, how do I compute distance between two points on a grid? You know, sorry? Yes, but that sounds difficult. <laughs> so I'm just gonna use the built-in function in P5. <laughs> And conveniently, it accepts four parameters, uh, which is the same as nine, x and y for the first point, x and y for the second point. Okay, let's, let's try. Oh, we need to check if it's less than max distance. Cool. So this kind of is starting to look like a network simulation, right? You can think of, you can see how we can extend it to maybe like an epidemic simulator or something like that, or maybe something a bit more happy, something happier. Um, this is what I want to show with the second sketch. Uh, what, let's play the what if game. What, what can we change about this? What can we, what quick change can we see? Can we do to see something weird? Change the colors. When they overlap. Uh, when, when, when the lines, uh, yeah, when they get to the point where, uh, where, uh, where uh, maybe. Uh, yeah. All right, that sounds interesting. Um, I'm going to do something similar though. Let's use, <laughs> let's, let's change the color of the line based on the distance. So for that, I'm going to, I'm going to try. I'm going to use a function called lerp color, which just kind of finds a midway point between two values. I don't remember the parameters. Let's check the reference. Okay, so from color to color and value between zero and one. Easy. Let's do red color. We can pass in strings as well to maybe a blue color. And the distance is going to be So the value is going to be distance. Let's put it in a variable. Distance divided by max distance. Is that is that is that correct? Let's try it up. Let's see what happens. And this is the color. So let's put this in the variable and use this to set the stroke. See what happens. All right, you can kind of see it, but let's uh, let's change it so we see it better. I can mess around with the stroke weight. How wide is the line? Let's set it to ten, and let's increase max distance so we see more lines. Go, cool. this is cool. All right. Um, another example for uh, what if is what if I just uh, messed it up and gave wrong order for parameters, right? 
So for example, the X from P1 with the Y from P2, then X from P2 and the Y from P1. This, this will happen, right? And this is, this is weird. I, you know, I don't like this, but it, is, but, it, but it is weird and can lead you to something a bit more uh, interesting, right? Any, any other suggestions? All right. Ooh, that does sound cool, but I think it's going to be too complicated for, the, for now. For now. Let's see. That sounds easy, so I'm going to do it. Uh, let's re uh, first of all, let's fix my mistake here. And let's erase the background once at the beginning. Ooh, very cool. Another interesting uh, effect you can use with background is erase it every frame using a color that has some opacity, has some alpha, right? So you will see traces of the previous frame, but it, but it will still erase some of it. Let's 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 give it a hundred and see what happens. Nothing. Let's lower the opacity. All right, cool. Very cool. All right, let's move on. The last sketch I wanted to show you is an example of using a very simple rule set to create something complex. So I'm going to uh, start with uh, an empty canvas. Let's increase it a bit. I'm going to delete the draw function. I'm going to, only going to render one frame so I can do it in the setup function. What I want to do here is essentially divide the canvas into tiles, squares, and in each tile, draw uh, a diagonal line from the top right to bottom left, or top left to bottom right randomly. That's it, that's my rule set. So I'm going to, let's define a constant for tile size, set it to 20, we can tweak it afterwards. And let's iterate, keep track of the X coordinate, start with zero until it uh, is out of bounds and increase by tile size. Same for Y coordinates. All right, just to see that the tiling works, I'm gonna render a square. X and at the X and Y points with tile size. We should see just squares uh, on the canvas. Works, all right. So now let's uh, have our diagonals. I'm going to draw a line first from top left to bottom right. So that would be from the X and Y uh, coordinate to X plus tile size, Y plus tile size. Let's check that it works. I'll keep the squares for now, just so we can see the tiles. You know what, let's increase tile size. All right, better? Yeah, even more. Cool. So let's now draw the other diagonal and comment this out. What will be the coordinates for the other one? Top right to bottom left. Yes. And y, right? X and y plus tile size. Let's see. Yes. Cool. All right. So now I just want to draw one of them randomly. An easy way to get a random Boolean is to use to get a random number between zero and one and check if it's less than half. If it is, let's render this diagonal. Otherwise, the other one. 
that's it. That, that's my sketch. Um, does it, before I run it, does anyone have uh, a guess what's going to be rendered? A mountain, maybe. Let's see. So we get a maze. It is a lousy maze. Like there's a lot of areas you can't reach. You can't really solve it. It's not a perfect maze, but it's still a maze, right? In in what like 14 lines of code. I can drop it to seven if I really want to. Super simple rule set that gives birth to something a bit more complex. Okay, that's my last sketch. Let's go back to the presentation. So what's next? If you want to start learning the basics, I highly recommend a YouTube channel called Coding Train. Really good uh, teacher, Daniel Schiffman. Super enthusiastic. He does a lot of uh, live coding as well and messes up a lot, but you can see how he fixes stuff, which is a great way to learn. He also has uh, a free book online called Nature of Code, where he teaches basics and also tries to imitate uh, natural behavior like flocking algorithms and stuff like that. Um, by now, like if I want to learn a new concept, I start by watching his video about it, and he usually has one, and then I do it. If you like the artworks in this presentation, you want to see more, it's just looking for these hashtags on Twitter and Instagram. Um, I highly suggest the January hashtag. January, January is an event in January every year where you get a prompt for each day and different people submit artworks based on that prompt. Always super interesting to see how uh, different people interpret things differently, approach it from a different direction, use different technologies, Really, really interesting. If you want to see more sketches and also see code, openprocessing.org is an amazing resource. Tons of uh, sketches with the code uh, right there. So you can see it. It renders in the browser. So you can see the sketch and then dive deeper and understand how it actually works, but also modify it, tweak it, and make it your own. If you're looking for a community, the generative subreddit uh, is pretty active. You can post your artwork, but also ask questions, have discussions. There's also a few discords if you're interested. And finally, uh, talk to me. I really like talking about that stuff, if you haven't noticed. Um, if you have any questions, you're looking how to start, you want to know how to start or anything else, reach out to me on Twitter or email or on the NashDiv Slack. Um, if you want to collaborate, please reach out to me. That's it. Uh, in, in this URL, QR code will lead you to the same place. You have a list of links. Check it out. Uh, thank you. Any questions? There is a Bezier curve uh, function that kind of gives you all the curves you need but I never fully understood it, so I, I can't <laughs> recommend it. <laughs> but if you're looking to yeah, draw curves, it's definitely in there. Uh, check, take a look at the reference site for a P5, super detailed with all the examples you need, um, very useful resource. Other questions? Yeah. Thank you. I thought you demonstrated a really cool creative thought process, and I was wondering if you could talk about uh, some of your inspirations. Like for, for example, uh, you know, the, the idea of, okay, I, I got here and now let's play a little game and sort of like structure ball, you know, structure play. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What, what do you think about that? Is, is, is there anything that um, inspired you, you know, to, to develop some of those heuristics? Yes. So I feel like my main inspiration actually comes from uh, modular synthesizers. Uh, and you can think about it as just you have a bunch of inputs and outputs, and you can connect anything to anything, right? Um, so you just start connecting stuff without like without thinking about where it's, it's going to lead you. And a lot of the times it's going to lead you nowhere, but also uh, some of the times it's going to lead you very interesting places. So I guess the main uh, mindset is just going to try out stuff without thinking what will happen. I'm just going to see it, right? Yeah, very good. Yes. Uh, 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 just to that comment, it's really often talked by uh, Fred Pinker. You know, being able to be, be 
Green State great art, all big things. Uh, his constituents against his party used to be, and he's had immediate feedback. So here's one of your talkets. He needs he to see stuff happening, and as he changes variable, as he changes things, you can see the, the, the output feeding the state. Really capture that that leading creativity that sometimes they can't see it. A lot of the times, this is also, it's just mistakes, right? So even uh, thinking about this picture, this is a bug. This is, the, this is the algorithm not implemented well, right? But the effect is amazing. Like it's by chance, just the part of the waterfall wasn't processed through the algorithm and then created this kind of like focal point, which I wasn't aiming at at all, but I love this picture, right? So happy mistakes. More questions? Yes. Uh, we looked at kind of two strategies to generate uh, this generative part. Uh, one where you adapt the set up front and like put the hook away to draw function entirely and just press the button and then generate the course. And then uh, the first type we looked at where uh, you have to draw function to uh, uh, are either continuously moves or like when you let the frames persisting, uh, it kind of continues to create a new thing over time and it's minute. Uh, and that is the coolest thing to me. Have you uh, done a lot of those where you like uh, set up a draw function, set up on your rules, and then step away for half an hour or an hour or you monitor it over time and you uh, play around like that? Yes. So it, it kind of changes. Well, based on, do you want to create an animation or do you want to create a static image, right? So this is a static image. Right. This is implementing the algorithm, letting it run, and it takes a while to run, and, and looking at the output. Um, I also like to generate uh, a lot of outputs, right? So a lot of variations using randomized uh, values and stuff like that, and, and then select the ones I like best, right? So the process, a lot of the process in, uh, I feel, in generative arts, other than building the code and writing the code and running it, the curation of it, right? And you can see this also emerging with the AI models to create image images or text. Um, it kind of becomes you're more of a curator than uh, a creator, or I guess both, right? So yes, different approaches. Uh, one to create animation, one to create static image. Both are super useful, kind of depending on your aim or goal. Very cool. More questions? Yes. Can you talk about using natural data? I'm curious if you've done anything with natural data or if you've seen anything that other people have done to feel like success. Uh, yes, there are a lot of uh, experiments on trying to kind of translate data sets from unrelated areas into uh, music, for example, or, um, or, or art, right? One of the examples I can think of is taking an animated GIF and turning it into MIDI messages, which control musical gear. Uh, so turning it into notes, right? Just super unexpected, what, what you're going to get. But does, there will be some structure to it as well. And, and oftentimes with music, repetition and structure kind of gives you, um, you know, uh, a vibe of completeness. So it's, it's a viable product. Like it's, it's, it's like a tangible, um, you know, results. Uh, so definitely interesting to take and combine different uh, data sets and just different components from totally different uh, areas uh, in, in technology. Good points. Questions? Any other questions? Cool. cool. Thank you for coming.